the worst thing that I've ever seen for no common sense in the airport in light of our new additional security is that while I was governor, seated governor in the state of Minnesota, I had to fly to Los Angeles. I was pulled out and totally, uh, uh, you know, searched with the wand and all that. And while the young man was doing it, I asked him, I said, well, when does common sense enter into this? And he said to me, well, what do you mean, sir? I said, well, when's the last time a seated governor attempted to hijack a plane? <laughs> and he had a great answer. He said, well, we can't make exceptions for anyone. And I said, that's fine. But I said, again, I ask you, when does common sense enter into this? And he said, well, what now? And I pointed because I had two bodyguards who are state troopers, Secret Service trained. And of course, they go through a different thing because they're going to carry weapons. And I pointed to these two guys in suits leaning against the wall waiting for me. And I said, you see the two guys over there wearing the suits? And he goes, yes. I said, well, those are my bodyguards, and they're getting on the plane with me. They're both armed with nine millimeters right now. I said, when we get on this plane, I'm the boss. I simply have to demand their weapon, and they have to give it to me. So I said, again, where is common sense here? I'm boarding the plane with two armed men carrying nine millimeters, and I'm being searched, and I'm being wanded to see if I'm dangerous. How silly can they get? Well, it's clear that the whole war on terror is being used to train us to be slaves, and that none of it is, is I mean, if you really believe Muslim terrorists did it, then, you know, that is, quote, profiling. So what they said is, okay, well, we won't profile. You'll all be guilty of deliberate innocent instead of using probable cause, which isn't profiling, it's something suspicious. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, it... You know, I, I just found it. And then, ironically, I was going to California. Here's how California treated me. The plane stopped before it even got up to the thing. They took me off the plane at that point. I was loaded into a California Highway Patrol car and off to do our business. Yeah, they're more professional. When we got done, they didn't even take me to the airport. They drove me right out onto the tarmac to the plane I was going to, stopped right below the plane, and I boarded the plane right there before anybody even inside, and I never even went through any type of security in California because I was the governor of Minnesota, and I assume California figured I wasn't exactly a... Uh, Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda terrorist. What a great story. <laughs> the true story, yeah, absolutely true, every word of it. That I was totally searched in Minneapolis, and I was the Minnesota governor at the time it happened. Well, a prophet's not known in his own country, they say. Hey, uh, Jesse, that was pretty wild today hanging out with Willie, wasn't it? Yeah, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Willie's a, Willie's a very bright guy, and uh, he knows he knows the issues that concern him and that he pays attention to, and he's pretty well read on them. He told me about Waylon Jennings, and he, back in like the 70s, going looking at that piece of property, and he bought it. And, uh, it's neat how it's up on that hill, all those hills all around it. Well, like, like I said to him, Willie, how do you leave? I said, to, you know, and he said, it's tough, but... It's his love of music. You know, he loves to play music. He loves to do shows. Obviously, he does hundreds of them a year. And Willie don't need to. You know, it isn't like Willie you know, needs the money or anything like that. And uh, so it's his love of, uh, of uh, music that does it. Because anyone else that had a beautiful place like he's got, you'd be hard-pressed to ever leave it. <laughs> no, I, I would be. He does over 200 shows a year. I know. I know. I did a movie called Redheaded Stranger. Oh yeah. And, uh, we built the town for that movie. Come check out the video. You play all games. Chess, poker, domino. Oh, there it is. Redheaded Stranger. Yeah. And uh, since then, we've done quite a few movies out here. So Willie, what do you mainly do when you're uh, when you're not touring? Nothing. <laughs> resting. <laughs> no, I know that sounds good. <laughs> That's what I've been doing, rest, kicking back and taking it easy. I got a horse, but I try not to bother him too much. Yeah. <laughs>
It's got a golf course, but you know, I go over there occasionally. But there, I've got a lot of options, you know. Yeah, yeah. I don't have anything that I'm gonna say, oh, well, when I get off, I'm gonna do this. Sure. When I get off, I'm gonna not do anything. And do this, do. this is a little piece of heaven. It's nice. I, I enjoy hanging out here. Oh, look, there's this John yeah. Wayne. They filmed that down by San Antonio, didn't they? What's that, no? Alma. Alma. Oh, yeah. I saw the Alma the last time I was in the San Yeah. That's a good tale. In fact, I stayed right at the hotel, right across the street. They had me right across the street, so I got up in the morning and walked over there, and the only thing we got to remember to do is take your hat off when you walk in. There's a hotel over there that's... That's uh, what so they tell you. Just make sure to remove your hat when you walk in, because it's a... It's, it's a sacred place. place. It's a sacred place now. There's a hotel across the street where the Rough Riders met. Yeah. Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, that's the hotel I stayed in. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's a nice it's hotel. It's like the hotel you put me in. Yes, you could say it's you know the old traditional. Yeah, he's in the dress club. Yeah. Then he, he checks me in today, Willie, and tells me it's haunted. I said that's all I need. What they're going to keep me up all night? But couldn't be haunted that bad because I'll tell you, I slept till nine nine. Hey, look, this they morning. just say it's haunted there. I don't know if it's true. Yeah, well, I think LBJ walks the halls. That's what they say on other people. That LBJ walks the halls? No, I just made that up. <laughs> no, actually, they, they, they say a bunch of people. I wish you would. I, I wish he like would. I'd have a few questions for him. Yeah. I'd like to run into him and ask him a couple of things that have been on my mind <laughs> for a few years. Speaking of JFK, I, I mean, the uh, E. Howard Hunt, I got the deathbed confession video, not just the audio. Rolling Stone barbed it last year. But an upcoming film, we just released it on the web for free for everybody to see it, but an upcoming film, we had more of the interview. And it's E. Howard Hunt, right before he died, you know, uh, uh, and his son, St. John Hunt, brought it to me. But, you know, he was the famous plumber, too, for Nixon. He was a CIA section chief. But, no, it, he admitted and named it. Of course, he got picked up as one of the tramps that day. Uh, people, you know, people saw the spitting image, and he said, yeah, no, uh, basically, we killed Kennedy. And uh, the media, other than Rolling Stone, is completely... Yeah, didn't even touch it. But, I mean, we've got it right there. Because I remember I was down in Mexico when, they, when it was went across the crawler that E. Howard Hunt had died at 88. I think that's how old he was. Yes. And I remember I was sitting down and I got pissed. I said, that son of a bitch, he took it all to the way. Didn't he? Didn't. That I got the footage. And then, no, and then I found out later that he had done a deathbed confession to his son. That wrote in so on. And, but when I first saw that he had died, I thought that bastard. He took it all to the grave with him. Everything he knows, because uh, uh, one of the interesting stories I heard about his son is that uh, initially Hunt, when Kennedy was killed, they asked him uh, what, uh, what, uh, where he was, and Hunt had given the story that that day he and his wife had gone out and bought Chinese, and that they came home and they were cooking Chinese dinner for all the kids, right? And his son says he was gone then. Well, no, his son, not even that. His son said, never cooked. my father never cooked. He said, in my entire life of growing up, I don't remember my father ever coming home and making dinner with my mom. That wasn't him. He was a CIA operative. He didn't make dinner at home. And uh, so that's when the son apparently at first thought, wait a minute, what's going on here? And I, the story had it that he was walking on a campus in California. Yeah. And he saw a photo of the three tramps of the yeah. Daly Plaza, and he looked at it and said, that's my father. His son tried to get it published, tried to give it to the media, they wouldn't take it. So he called me last year, and he said, do you want this footage? He'd, he'd already, because you know, he, he, he'd been a listener, he'd already brought it to the media. Here, here's my dad, wasn't even asking for money. Yeah. He gave it to me, and I said, well, let me pay you for this. He said, no, I don't want any money, just, just get it out. And so we went ahead and put it out. But the point is, you know, for free on the internet. But I mean, he, you know, his son d didn't know what to do with that. He just said, well, all you can do is put it out. And months and months have happened, and we released even more of it last week. Not one publication. I mean, it's his father on video admitting how they killed him, everything. I mean, it, it, this is the former CIA section chief. And that's a big deal. And, uh, and let me tell you, I, I didn't like having that tape on me until we got it on the internet. You know, it's dangerous to have that. Really? Oh, hell yeah. But, but the point is, they broke in, uh, in St. John Hunt's house, you know, his son. They tore everything, you know, to bits, stole papers. And then he lives in Northern California. The car came up, sort of bump, you know, trying to run him off the road. So uh, The kid, the son? Yeah, and that's why he figured out. Well, he actually 
called me to come on the radio, and I said, listen, no wonder they're breaking in your house trying to kill you. I said, look, just put it on the Internet. He said, well, I don't even really know how to do that. And I said, well, get it on the Internet. And then he just said, well, I'll just you know, give you the tape. And uh, we, so we put it on the web. But, I mean, of course he was in danger. You know, you know why they give him no credibility, don't you? What, St. John Hunt? Oh, because he had some little drug conviction yeah, no, or something. No, he was a former drug addict. No. And so because he was that, apparently... Now but now he's a college was, graduate well, and takes and, care of but handicaps. The, but the point is, what should that have to do with anything? Well, exactly. It's his father. It's a video of his yeah, father. That's, that's irrelevant. If the kid had a drug problem, so what? It doesn't... Uh, like, I always love to use the term, how come all prostitutes have bad vision? <laughs> I can't be you a Because whenever... Yeah, whenever... If you bring a prostitute in as a witness, you can't believe her because she... Obviously, all prostitutes can't see. You know? I mean, what, what, what the hell has their job got to do or what they do with what they saw? <laughs> so it's always kind of a laugh to understand, yes, all prostitutes have bad vision. Well, they tell us the name of this town. Luck, Texas. Luck, Texas. You're either in luck or you're out of luck. Out of luck, one or the other. Yeah, I first got, got introduced. I'm, I'm not an early Willie guy because I was a heavy rock and roller as a kid. But I'll always remember when I first got in wrestling, there was always, there's a lot of Texans in wrestling and all that that you'd meet. And I'll never forget when uh, 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 Waylon's album, Luke and Bach, Texas, came out because we'd all ride together usually. And, and uh, the, the guys that were the southern wrestlers all had Luke and Bach, Texas, and there were Waylon and Willie and the boys. And that was the first I ever really knew of you because yeah. I wasn't a country guy. I was a Rolling Stone, Beatles type, you know, that was when I grew up up north. And, but I always remember Luke and Bach, Texas, with Waylon, and, and then I and then I went home and told my wife, guess what? And I even met Jerry Jeff, who sings about the trains, because uh, Jerry Jeff Walker was here last time I was here, and because uh, of Jerry Jeff's train songs mm -hmm. was yes, the lyrics in there. <laughs> so, I, but I always remember that song real well because we'd all be on the road together. They'd always throw Waylon's tape in, and we'd be yeah, driving down the road together. <laughs> Willie, that's an amazing painting. It, 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 it's you and buildings and looks like a fire. That's the uh, Hill County Courthouse in Hillsborough, Texas. Uh, the, it burned down and so we did a benefit up there to build it back. And after we got it built back, we went back and did another benefit to show the people that it was back. Willie, how long has it been since you cut your hair? I don't remember. Just FYI. Yeah. I just <laughs> I just can't believe you're here. <laughs> you don't remember the last I time? Really? No. That's hilarious. Maybe I'll catch you someday. <laughs> I've been at it ever since I got out of office. They wanted me to shave my head again to do all this stuff and I refused. Yeah. Well, I only did it because to shave your head you gotta be in the right frame of mind to do it. You gotta really be tired of your hair. Well, yeah. and you gotta be in the right frame of mind. <laughs> even a guy even a guy like me that's bald, I still I, I uh, and I fight with people over this. Do you know who the most discriminated people in America are? Bald men who have lost their hair. And I say this because watch TV every night and see how we're insulted. Every day on television, you will watch and be told you're lesser of a human being. Well, that's Madison because, Avenue. Because you don't have hair. Madison Avenue makes women, beautiful women, think they're ugly and they're not. Yeah, but this is, this is not Madison Avenue. This is a male thing. But, but I'm saying it's the same in, thing with women. In the male genre, we're made to feel if you don't have a full head of hair, you're a lesser of a no, man. No, it's just bull, yeah. And the reason I say that is also, like, I'll never forget the most offensive ad of them all. I was watching one night on TV, and a guy comes out, and he's got an arm around two blondes, and he looks at the camera and goes, you can have fun again. In other words, insinuating that I, because I lost my hair, have no fun in life anymore. But in reality, but a lot of women that, like that. But well, in they reality, use the same commercial for Viagra. <laughs> yeah, in reality, women hair don't matter. And you know where I learned that? I was doing the XFL football that one year. Remember when Vince came out with the alternative football league? And remember those cheerleaders he hired? Holy crap! I mean, he went out to every team and bought the Playboy Playmates of the Month for all twelve months. And these were all the cheerleaders, right? The most beautiful women you've ever seen. And one day we're there early at the game and I'm down on the field and the cheerleaders were over in the corner and they were practicing whatever it was they were going to do and I had the shaved head at the time. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to find out. 
So I walked over to these 12 girls over there and I said, ladies, I said, can I ask you kind of a personal question? They said, sure. You know, they took a break. I said, I'd like to know, does hair on a man matter? And the reason I knew I got the truth was because they all answered so quickly. There was no thought. They all, all these girls, and these were the most beautiful girls you could imagine. They all looked at me and said, absolutely not. It doesn't make any bit of difference. And I said, well, it's the man. It's who the well, person well, is. No, way. we're made, this is a male thing. No, it's brainwashing. We're know. made at a young age to believe if you lose your hair, you're somehow lesser of a male. That you have no self-confidence. Well, you don't believe it, but it's pumped in you, Willie. And I use, for example... So that's the difference. Willie is immune to the propaganda. Imagine if they, well, imagine <laughs> if they did that to women with breast implants. The outrage there'd be. If they got on TV every night and had all these ads telling women, look, if you go get synthetic breast implants, you'll have better personality, you'll have fun again, your whole life will change, you'll be more attractive, you'll be the complete woman. Your tits will taste like chalk. Right. <laughs> but, but, and, and, and if, oh they, if they did that to women every day and pounded that, you would hear an outcry. You'd hear people saying, you know, lawsuits and all but with bald men, they can get away with it. Well, now we've heard that the, 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 the bald men rant, but it's absolutely true. One of my best friends, who's a, a Los Angeles homicide detective, gave me a ride home one night from a thing in L.A., and he looked at me and said, you have to run for president. He said, you, you are the person that has to do it. And I said, come on, Dennis. I said, don't put pressure on me like that. I said, I don't, you know, I don't want that job. Especially, I wouldn't want it now. I mean, be it Obama or McCain who ends up with this job, it's going to be horrible because they're going to have to spend their entire four years cleaning up George Bush's mess. Well, more than that, the country's so run by foreign corporations and special interests, the president really doesn't have that much power. Well, He's got a bully pulpit, yeah. and if he was a good guy, he could change things and use the Constitution. But as they are what, now, they just... They Alex, just, Alex, let me ask you this. What do you think would happen if I ran and won? They'd probably kill you. Really? Do I, you really think I so? Think, I think, well... I, think I mean, because I am a rogue. I, you I know, mean, I think they would try to... Me, they would try to compromise you. I mean, I mean, that says who you are, but I trust that you're a good guy and, and, and you, know, who, you know, who you say you are, and you have a pretty good record of that. And I don't think you would go along with what they wanted you to do. And, and they either... They might be scared of killing you to make you a martyr. They might... Just try to drag dirt out and destroy in the media. Yeah. But I mean, I, I mean, I mean, if you didn't go along, or with that, uh, not even drag dirt out, make up dirt. Well, no, that's what yeah. I mean. Well, I mean, you know, they'll take one little sure. speck and then, sure. and, or like one percent truth, or or no truth. I mean, I used to think they meant that, like with politicians and people in media, they would just take things about us and exaggerate them or twist them. In my own little life, I found people now will just whole cloth make up stuff. I mean, just just none of oh, yeah. it's true. Oh, yeah. I've had that already too. And, and it, I've actually had it printed in writing where the paper had to retract it. Oh, I have too. That you was know, it. I've, I've had situations where the whole thing was made up multiple It was times. in the Dallas Morning News that I said, kill Michelle Malkin. And then I sent the... Who's she? She's like some neocon and post oh, early finger okay. stuff. But, 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 but we, we sent the Dallas Morning News the video, and I didn't say that. There was some provocateur. It was like with her as a joke, going, oh, you want to kill Michelle Malkin? And, 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 and the Dallas Morning News had to retract that. But the point is, is I mean, you know, uh, I don't know, it's just amazing. Oh well, yeah, you know what they got me for one time? They said that a, a, an old elderly couple in Montana said I was out there and I jumped up on a table at a stripper bar and they had to physically remove me. Just made up. And that was printed in the Minneapolis paper, those allegations. And, you know, and I, I, I laughingly said, I've been to Montana twice. I said I went through there when I was a child going to the World Fair in Seattle with my with my mother and I said the second time I've ever been to Montana <laughs> was uh, traveling back from Portland, Oregon when I had finished wrestling there driving with my wife. I said I hardly doubt that I would have gone into a stripper bar on either occasion and had to be pulled and removed from the stage. Well no, I mean, that's <laughs> that false image of just like a a, uh, a out of control nut when you're when you're you seem like a pretty controlled guy. Well, I've done my share of stuff, which I'll take credit for. But certainly, when I didn't do it, I won't take credit for it. Why did that couple make it up? 
Uh, I think they were elderly, and I think that they probably saw someone with a shaved head and was big and reminded them of me. That's that's the best I could come up with. I really don't think they did it thinking that, that they were overly, you know, like they were an attack squad. I had the same thing. We lived in this neighborhood. I think that they just, it was a case of mistaken identity where these elderly people just saw this incident happen and somehow figured out or assumed that it was me uh, four, three, five years, whatever it was supposedly earlier. I don't know. I, I really didn't answer for that, but, you know, I just said it's ridiculous. I mean, you know, I have been to Montana traveling through it twice. But I said I can't even recollect when and where I stopped to get gas, even though it's a very big state, I'm sure I must have. But I said the only two times were when I was a child on the train with my mom, when uh, she and my aunt and my brother and I all went to the World's Fair in Seattle, and uh, the other time would have been passing through coming back from How was the World's Fair in Seattle? Great as a kid. You know, when I went there, it was cool. They, I, the thing I remember most about it, they had a big container there that had one million silver dollars in it. And this was way back in the early 60s where a million dollars was really a lot of money then. You know, today it's not. But they had this huge container in a room and it was, you know, a million silver dollars in there. But a million silver dollars, I remember, even that's then, I was worth more than a million bucks. Yeah, that, well, that's what I remember the most about, uh, about that they had this big container with a million silver dollars in it. So I think the cover-up's the biggest piece of evidence of, that it is an inside job. That that yes. certainly plays a huge role in it, uh, you know. And in the show I'm doing, we've actually shifted on that too, saying maybe we should go, and instead of worrying about presenting the two sides, is the show should say what a massive failure, not on the parts of the volunteer workers. You have to separate them because they did a hell of a job. Those people that went in there and worked for six to nine months are heroes that went in there. But the point we want to get to is who was giving the orders? Who, who was telling all these guys to remove everything? Like, I'll never forget Rudy Giuliani bragged 24 hours later that they had already pulled 120 truckloads of debris was gone. And initially you as an individual would go, oh, yay, isn't that great? It sounds good on the surface, but then when you think about it, you go, well, wait a minute, that's 120 truckloads of evidence yeah. that you see in hindsight that were removed within 24 hours. I interviewed one man, and he's, he's an honorary firefighter. He's actually an emergency response guy who, uh, who uh, spent 257 days at the site and never was paid a penny, and he's dying now. He won't admit it, but he's dying. I sat with him. He showed me photos of the guys he worked with. They're all dead from just being down there. He told me about a year later, they finally sent him to a specialist. And um, they sent him to a specialist, and, and he talked about how they put him in. That, that first, they, they found 14 different lethal toxins in his body, 14 different things. Then they put him in this almost heat box where all he did was drink liquids and urinate. And they, they sweated him. And he said they took white towels and rubbed them on my arms and they came off yellow. You know, this was, they were trying to get all the toxins to come out his pores. Yes, it was the only, the only way they knew to attempt to do it. Wow. And, uh, well, the sad thing about this gentleman Mike's story is that he goes around now. He actually wrote their book one year after 9-11, before the 9-11 Commission, and stated that he saw them discover one of the black boxes, and his partner came back to him and said, no, we found three of the four. And he believes his partner, because his partner would have no reason to lie to him. They were there together. He saw one of them, his partner saw the other two, but they said, in their book, they said three of the four were uh, were recovered, and then what caused him grave concern was when 9-11 came out, the commission and said there were no black boxes found, and all of this stuff, they never found them at the towers, and to this day, they won't acknowledge that they ever found them, and this guy said, that's bullshit, I saw one, I saw it recovered, and he also said, how could they not find them when we went through that debris so fine that we were, we were finding little bone fragments? that we could then DNA match up to victims. He said, you're telling me we wouldn't find the black boxes even if they were wrecked? 
we would have still found the physical black box. And you should see what they've done to this guy today, Willie. This guy's a hero. He's a hero. And he, he was going around to schools with children talking about his experience that day, and he's got a couple relics, pieces of metal that he kind of hijacked from the site. Well, he's also got what was given to him, one of those uh, oxygen bottles and units that all firemen wear, and he uses that as part of his presentation. Well, New York came after him and said that he had that he illegally and that he wasn't supposed to have that oxygen bottle. They wanted to know what fireman gave it to him. And he said, I'm not telling. He said, I'm not ratting the guy out. He said, I will not do with me what you're gonna, but I'm not gonna say who gave me this. You know, it was given to me by a fireman. But he said, I'm not gonna rat the guy. Well, they ended up, they threw him in jail for three days. When he finally got out of jail, it went in front of the district attorney of Brooklyn, and the district attorney of Brooklyn looked at it and went, what the hell is this? He said, this man came to my son's school and made his presentation to teach kids. He said, what is this crap? He threw it out, hammered it, he said, gone. Threw it out of court. Thank goodness we had a, they had a district attorney with some common sense. Mm -hmm. But the point being is, here, this guy worked 250 some days for nothing. And now because he's in possession of something he's not supposedly supposed to be in, they throw him in jail for three days. Like he said to me, they lost 350 firemen that day, and they're worried about an oxygen tank. Willie, what's your take on uh, how they blocked the funding for the firefighters and police and emergency workers from all that deadly dust? I mean, why Why wouldn't Congress, uh, I mean, we've been to Congress, have you know made a film about it. Uh, and they they just say, no, we're not going to take care of it, even though all the CAT scans and hospitals say it's killing them. And uh, this firefighter uses a 600 number. The official government it, uh, reports a few months ago say it's uh, over 1,100 have died. Well, first of all, there's a long list of things that uh, we could talk about that we don't like about this government and what it's doing and what it has done. and. Uh, it goes back further than the Bush administration. It goes all the way back to other administrations a long time ago when this country started going the wrong way and uh, started doing things around the world thinking that we were the world's policemen and uh, if also uh, we were the world's resource gatherer. If there was something over there you had, we're going to come get it. Uh, we'll make you a deal you can't turn down. So that's been going on as long as I can remember, as long as I've been watching our government operate. So this is just one more time I think that they've stepped over the line doing things that they, as far as I'm concerned, that's not what I hired them for. They, they work for me, they work for you, they work for Jesse, and they're screwing up. Well, I think that, like you said earlier, the people are finally really getting fed up, and I don't think they're going to go back to sleep again. I think I think the revolution is I on. Do. Well, let me I do. I know I think, Mr. Glenn I think they're, they're going to go back to sleep. Well, if we wake <laughs> the motherfuckers up, you know. <laughs> well, and you then can let wait. them go back yeah, to sleep. We'll We've wake them up. Job. We'll wake them up, but I I bet they go back to sleep again. Well, Willie, what do you say? I'm wrong. I, I mean, I, I listen, hope I'm wrong. I talked well, I don't I, know. I I just I believe some of them will go back to sleep because one of some of them didn't want to get woke up. But there are a group of intelligent young people out there, not very many of them my age or your age. Most of the people my age or your age think just exactly like what you said. Things are the way they are. Don't mess with them. Go do your job. Keep your head down. You know, uh, Don't stir up anything. But there's some young people out there with a lot of guts, a lot of balls. They're going to stir it up and they're going to elect Obama, they're going to uh, elect uh, some government officials, they're going to elect some senators and congressmen who will go in there and start doing the right thing for a while. And then you're right. In a little while, everybody will go back to sleep, 
and the guys will say, all right, we're going to let them, let them have it for four to eight years because look how we screwed it up. Let's back out, out, out of the way and let them have our problems that we created for a while. And we'll go over here and, and, and uh, we'll reorganize and we'll think it over and we'll raise some more money and we'll go get it again. I, I agree fully because let's go, let's, uh, Alex, we talked about history and how if you don't study history, the old cliche, you're deemed to repeat it. Well, look at my generation and Willie's. We're the generation of the 60s. We were supposed to be the rebels. We were supposed to be the ones who were anti-establishment, the ones who learned from Vietnam, the ones that saw all this stuff go down. And yet, what has happened to all of us? I saw Where that, did we all go? I was so proud of the peaceniks. I was so proud of the guys who got out there and fought against the war and to come home from Vietnam and say, hey, that's wrong. But they went back to sleep. That's right. But That's but right. you talked they about went back to wait. Our okay. generation, no. we're the generation supposedly of we're in charge now. But yet, when you go back, the hypocrisy. We were the generation that believed in free love. Now we're telling you abstinence. We're the generation that used drugs, and yet today Drug we're war. fighting the biggest war on drugs in the history of the land exact opposite of what we were. We're the generation that should have known about war, that should have known about getting into a deceitful war, and yet here we've allowed, we're the leaders now, and we've taken the young people into the same thing that we did, and that's what troubles me the most. Where the hell are all the people? Did we all go to sleep? Did we all become born-again Republicans? What did we? What happened to the gener, the Vietnam generation mm -hmm. that ought to be in charge today? That ought to know better. Let me what just bring up we what happened to peace on earth. I remember growing up that that was what we were all taught was going to happen one day. I go to church and they well, you've got the Prince of Peace, Jesus. He's going to come and there's going to be peace on earth for a thousand years. I said I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, where is it? Well, let me we're just ask waiting. this question, and, and, and then we better move on down the road because I don't want to take too much of Willie's. I don't want to abuse his time, and we're very thankful for it. Um, specifically, though, you mentioned Super Size Me totally changing the fast food industry. I mean, it's just changed a lot. That's one film. Look at Loose. For now. For now. But, but the point is, look at what Loose Change did. Over 100 million downloads for free online, yeah. and it woke up to tens of millions of people worldwide. Oh, woke me up. So, so oh, there's yeah. another example of individuals standing up and young people, yep. and, but, but, but everybody, and, and great elders like you know you guys, you know, out there standing up. I mean, look, we know stuff's bad, but it'd be a hell of a lot worse if it wasn't for people like Willie Nelson and Jesse Ventura and folks like Dennis Kucinich. So all I'm saying is, for everybody else sitting on their butts, be more like a Willie Nelson and get out there and do something. Well, yeah. But, but that's, that's essentially the yeah. problem. We, we do it, and uh, hopefully something will will change. But the problem is this, everybody lives in their own little world and if their own little world is not affected directly, they will ignore it. But right now with the economy sinking, oh, yeah. their world is affected. Oh yeah, I agree. Yeah, and I agree. Uh, gasoline, uh, they are affected. Oh, yeah. They're going to have to oh, start yeah. growing their own vegetables again. Oh yeah. That's great. I'm glad to see them having to get out and dig in that soil and plant a seed and we'll sit back and watch it grow. But that's America. And hard times will force us to... Where they've been is not American. Living on, uh, you know, eight or ten houses and six yachts and uh, going off and, and starting these big corporations where they screw me and you out of money and they go overseas and spend <laughs> it. That's not America. Now, I want to see one of those guys get out there and have to grow his own potatoes. Well, I think that's another issue. Bring into justice corporate crooks, but, but they run the regulators now, so we have to get back control of the regulators so we can punish these crooks. No, what we have to do is simpler than that. We have to stop electing Democrats and Republicans, and we have to start electing and destroying the system they've created that is so corrupt within itself that we're a two-party dictatorship now. And that you know how I put it, Alex? Here's what you have today, and I do have a little experience on this. Politics in America today is identical to pro wrestling. And what I mean by that is, in front of the cameras and the public, we all hate each other. And I'm going to kick my opponent's butt, I'm going to wail him from here to high water and beat the crap out of him. Yet behind the scenes, we all are friends going out to dinner. Went to dinner together. And, and, and it's all a work. All intermarried. Show business. It's show biz. 
And that's what you have today in politics. The Democrats and Republicans aren't really opposed to each other. They're all part of the same. And I can, and I can use as an example, Alex, the election of 2006. All right, up till 2006, you had a Republican Congress and a Republican president. Then along came the election of 2006, which was the war in Iraq. The U.S. people spoke clearly. They said, get us out of Iraq. So they elected the Democrats. The Democrats took both houses. And two years later, are we out of Iraq? No. Because the Democrats are spineless. They're part of they're owned by the same corporate interests. Exactly. And so and when the Dems always look at me and go, Well, wait, we can't get out. We can't override Bush's veto. And I look at them and go, But you control all the money. You don't have to override Bush's well, veto. We're gonna find out real quick. All Obama. you have to do is well, Obama's already fudging. He's yeah. fudged since day one in this election, where he first said, we're getting out. Well, now it's a timetable, and now it's da-da-da, because they're getting to him. They're understanding that uh, he, and he ain't going to be able to get him out, because people more powerful than him got us in. I mean, your life has is, been is pretty interesting. You've seen a lot of things, and a lot of different twisted turns. Where, what do you see happening to yourself in the future? I mean, is there a run for president? I don't know. Uh, you know, I've learned uh, one thing is that you never say never, but uh, right now I would say no. Uh, to me, it's, it's uh, you know, that's that, that would be one of the most difficult jobs I could imagine to undertake in the world. And I just, and I guess the tough thing for me, Alex, is this. Going, I'm a very free spirit. And going for a job like that is is doing the opposite. It, it, I've said this many times. Being the president's an oxymoron. Yeah. And here's what I mean. You're the head of the free world, but yet you yourself have no freedom. Yeah. And that's what it is. You're the head of the free world, but where is your freedom? You can't go anywhere without, without masses of people around you. Probably the only time you're alone is in your bedroom. You know, I would guess that would be the only, or in the White House, I'm sure there's, you could go to a few rooms there and be by yourself. But for the most part, you're never, ever, I remember when I left governor, how strange it was that day that I left office and I all, all of a sudden was naked. What I mean by that is no more protection. And it was weird because you went from being fully protected to the very next day when the new governor sworn into nothing. You and think I, you needed the protection? Did I need the protection? Yeah. I got a death threat a week when I was in office. Oh, yeah. Now, probably 99.9 .9 of those death threats are phony, but you have to address every one of them seriously. Because there's real ones. Because you don't know the one that you do deem as phony could end up real. That's like Dick Cheney with the dark side. I, I've always believed for the most part, though, that the person that's going to harm you is not going to warn you. No, no, exactly. That's, that's the way I, I kind of, but you still have to take them very seriously. It was so bad, my daughter got a death threat. And she, at the time, was just a sophomore in high school. You know, a beautiful young kid going to school. And, uh, some guy said he was going to chop her up into little pieces. And unfortunately for him, he was a blithering idiot because he did it over the internet. <laughs> and all it took for my state trooper intelligence squad to do was follow the internet to its source and he was a young gentleman that worked at Best Buy and all of a sudden six state troopers walked into Best Buy and took him to jail of which, of which he did go to jail because it is a felony to threaten a public official. Yeah, you know if you're an elected official and someone threatens you with bodily harm or violence or death or whatever that's a felony. Rest assured, the politicians take care of themselves. Well, it's a terroristic threat to anybody. Yeah, but even worse to a politician. I have people threaten me all the time, even using their real names. I'm just like, they're lucky I don't have time to go press stuff on them. But, um, no, it's, uh, no, I had a death threat a week, and, uh, you know, you have to take them seriously. What are you doing? I know sure. you're being a lot of people. Sure. I'm right behind you, brother. Well, I'm, I'm down here now with Willie. 
Good for you. LeBron Paul to Willie. The backyard opened in May of 1993 with a concert from Willie Nelson, and it closes with Willie Nelson. It's appropriate, and the guy that brought out Willie Nelson this evening, Jesse Ventura, uh, how'd this come to be? What, what are you doing here? Well, I've, I've been a friend of Willie's for a number of years, and when I found out that Willie was going to close down the backyard, I figured it was time to fly down from Minnesota and get a chance to see the backyard. I've never seen it before, and so uh, since this is the last night and Willie's closing it down, it was important for me to be here and watch Willie do it. It's an awfully nice venue, isn't it? Oh, it's a terrific <laughs> venue. I can't understand why they're closing it. I'd be opening it if I were them. Why shut it down? It's a, a great gathering for people, you know, on the weekends and that. They have a good time, and we need more of that in the country right now. We've all heard of enough about the bad times in our country. It's time to get back to thinking positive again and start moving in a positive direction. And that positive direction you notice, for you is you anyone what, but, right? Yeah, you notice what my <laughs> shirt says, anyone but. And until we break this trend of electing Democrats and Republicans people and start electing independents, we will get out of the problem that we're in if we do that. But if we look ahead a week, one of those guys is going to win. Oh, certainly one of them is going to win, but neither one of them will have my vote. Because, uh, and, and I urge people that, remember, voting is not picking a horse race. That isn't why you vote. You're voting to pick the person you, who you most believe can run our country the best. So vote your heart and vote your conscience. And if you do that, then you haven't wasted your vote. It's not about picking a winner. It's about picking the person you most want to run the country. And in the meantime, there's this politics, of, uh, this cross-section of politics and music that we've got here tonight. Well, there's always been that. You know, music has always been part of our lives, and unfortunately, politics works its way into music, which is probably the negative part of music. But then again, music greatly sings about politics, too. So they go hand in hand. And my belief is, and I challenge all the singers of today, where are the war protest songs of today like we had in the 60s? It's time for those musicians to get on board. All right, there he is, Jesse Ventura, and uh, he's here to bring on Willie Nelson, and Willie Nelson is here to close out the backyard. 16 years of live music. I won't try to understand. Let the devil take tomorrow. Cross tonight, I need a friend. Dead and gone. No, but uh, hey, Jimmy, thanks for all you do, my friend. Hey, we're we're uh, beating back some of the toll roads. We're uh, beating back some of the toll roads. Oh, I know. There's been, been, been a lot of success everywhere. We're tearing them up. I'm there with you, Jesse. It's great. It's an exciting time to be here. Hey, hey, real fast. Let's get you two with Jimmy. Real fast. We'll get two minutes with you and Jimmy. The clouds are rolling. You guys talking about the rally for the republic in minnesota okay we can do that yeah that was great you had a fabulous speech there uh, in minnesota i enjoyed every every well, second thanks. of thanks <laughs> and uh and it was great to be there and feel like you were at least at the right place didn't well you? wasn't it yes very much so you know the thing that i found most remarkable jimmy was this i was at the ron paul is if you want to call it counter convention that day that we were there together right. Well, the next morning I was invited over because I had to do Fox and CNN, so I went over to St. Paul where the actual Republican convention was. Right. And when I arrived that morning, the remarkable thing I noticed was at our convention, there was no additional security. There was nobody outside. There was regular Asia security who was in that building when the timber was played. When I went over to St. Paul, I saw firsthand what it will be like if they ever place our country under martial law because at the Republican convention, it was martial law implemented in the city of St. Paul, which I found pathetic. I mean, you couldn't even pull up to within eight blocks of the building. You had to go through three of these big rings of security, these temporary, and there were SWAT teams every hundred feet. And there wasn't even really, there. there wasn't really much uh, uh, security at all at the other deal, was None. It? All we had was around. Asia. Asia. They're the normal people when the Timberwolves play. They're yeah. always there. They're, and that's what I found so remarkable. We were the people that didn't need to be protected. 
we were the people that anyone could walk in and walk out, and yet over at St. Paul, helicopters are flying. It was a case of martial law, and I thought, my God, is that what our country is now in its political arena? I would have rather been with you we listening a, to you play we had music, a great time. and we, we had, had a, a fantastic time. time. And Minnesota loves Jimmy Vaughn. <laughs> I love Minnesota. We had a it's great a, time. Didn't it's you? a great. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. You Jimmy should have been there. You should have been yeah, there. Yeah, everybody should have been there. Great to see you Everybody again, and you're, you. you're you. still <laughs> picking that guitar good. All right. Thank and you. I'll keep listening. All right, baby. And it seems right. like only yesterday. She had it funny. Now time just slips away. Visit InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. When you're on the site, you can also tune in 24 hours a day to my daily radio broadcast. There's also a free iPhone app to listen to the syndicated radio show when and where you want.